All right, I think we can get started. There are like um, 54 um, attendees right now and the number is growing. So hello um, everyone, welcome to ASIC seminar series. Um, this is John, the seminar coordinator, um, and together with me is Ms. Kelly Manley. Um, Kelly is our communication specialist. Kelly and I will be um, today's moderator. We are excited to have our speaker, uh, Professor Brian Poole, um, joining us from uh, Colorado. And just so you know, then this seminar is being recorded um, and will be later published on our YouTube channel. Please be free to ask questions. You can do so um, by raising your virtual hands and we will unmute you. And you can also send us a um, text message if you can. Uh, let me um, first introduce the speaker. So Professor Brian Toole was the founding chair of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science and University of Colorado. He has published over 350 peer-reviewed papers on atmospheric and planetary science. He received the AMS Rossby Research Medal, the AGU Roger Webby Medal and was recognized by UNEP for contributing to the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize awarded to the UN and Al Gore. Um, Professor Tuan has been a leader of um, 10 NASA aircraft built missions studying the ozone hole, clouds, and air pollution. He has studied aerosols and clouds in every part of Earth's atmosphere, almost every solar system planet and beyond. So let's welcome the speaker and I will hand this over to Professor Tu. So Professor Tu, please proceed. Okay. Well, today I'm gonna to talk to you about the extinction of the dinosaurs and nuclear wars. So you might wonder what these two things have to do with each other. And the answer is the climate science of stratospheric black carbon. So let's see here if I can advance the slide. <clears throat> Too far advanced. <clears throat> so many mechanisms have been proposed for the extinction of the dinosaurs, but most of them just don't have any data to support them. So this um, little cartoon from a cartoonist um, is my favorite of these. The real reason dinosaurs became extinct is because they were smoking cigarettes. I like this because it's cigarette butts anywhere in the geologic record where there are also dinosaurs. So it's pretty clear that this is not the reason that dinosaurs became extinct. There's lots of other theories like this. For example, five or 10 years ago, a famous American paleontologist suggested the dinosaurs all caught the flu and died. This is not a viable theory. It's not just the dinosaurs that went extinct. About 75% of all the species we know about on the planet became extinct. And there's no reason that plankton in the ocean would have caught the flu at the same time as the dinosaurs. The idea that an asteroid um, caused extinctions is older than many people realize. It was proposed in the 1980s by Harold Urey, a very famous scientist at the time. He wrote a paper in Science and said that the timing of asteroid and comet collisions on Earth is about the same as the timing of geologic eras and other geologic time units, and therefore they're probably caused by asteroid collisions. Nobody paid any attention to this, and uh, most I'm probably the only person left on the planet that knows about this paper because it didn't have any data. It was just a coincidence. So all this changed in uh, the early 1980s when Walter Alvarez and his father and their group at Berkeley um, found that at the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs, the Earth was hit by an asteroid. Um, so this is Walter and Louie on the right, and Walter has his fingers in this crack in the rocks. And here I am pointing to a similar thing in uh, Trinidad State, Park in Colorado, uh, where they're in Gubbio, Italy. So this layer is spread all over the earth or rocks of the appropriate age are exposed. Uh, Walter is a alpine geologist and he was on summer vacation in Italy. 
he knew about some people looking at these geologic strata and he went over to see if he could do something by trying to get away from his family. Um, at any rate, the uh, paleo uh, people looking at the geologic strata there were not anxious to work with Walter because they said, oh, well, go over there. And uh, there's this little funny layer right in here um, where Walter's got his fingers. And uh, that layer occurs in many places where the dinosaurs went extinct. So uh, Walter called up his dad and they decided to figure out how long it took to put that layer down. And they knew they could do this by measuring the amount of iridium. Because iridium is a siderophile element. It went to the core of the earth when the core was formed. So it's depleted in the crust, but it's abundant in meteorites. Um, so you can time how long it takes things to occur from measuring iridium. And basically they found that the whole layer was meteoritic debris. Um, and so they hypothesized that an asteroid it hit. And this thin layer very precisely marks this extinction. Of course, dinosaurs are pretty rare fossils, but if you look at the plankton record, it goes right up this layer and vanishes. So what's in this layer? This is the, the data we have to work with. So I've already mentioned there's iridium in there, but there's a lot of particles in there. And it's the particles that killed the dinosaurs. So this is called the clay layer evidence because the layer that I was mentioning um, is basically formed because there were not any calcareous plankton left. And so the carbonate disappeared from the sedimentary layer there and it was left over with clay and other stuff washing off the continents. <clears throat> okay, so one thing that's in there are these quartz grains. So this is a polarization picture through an optical microscope, and you can see these bands here. These are shock fronts caused by a shock wave. This doesn't come from volcanic eru eruptions. It only comes from very energetic shock waves, like from an asteroid impact. So this is another piece of evidence that this is an impact layer. Another piece of evidence is that this layer is very thin over most of the Earth, only a few millimeters thick. But it thickens up as you move toward the Yucatan Peninsula, where the crater is. It's centimeters thick in the United States and hundreds of meters thick in the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, the interesting thing from the climate point of view in this layer are these spherules. From, and these, these things were probably formed because during the impact, the asteroid was vaporized and part of Mexico was vaporized. And this hot vapor plume rose above the Earth, far above the Earth, and uh, the material recondensed as it cooled and formed these spherules. So these spherules are about as big as a grain of sand, they're a couple hundred microns in diameter. And as I'll tell you in a minute, they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere as shooting stars. A really surprising thing in this layer is elemental carbon. So all these little particles here are monomers of black carbon. You can see a number of them, they're around 50 nanometers in size. And they've clustered together to form fractal soot particles uh, that are much bigger, tenth of a micron or so in diameter. And this is exactly what you see from forest fires in modern day and also in the geologic record from other forest fires. There is so much black carbon in this layer that it requires that you burn almost everything on the surface of the earth. So this was a global wildfire that consumed all the vegetation and plants and other biomass that we know about. There's other things in the layer that have not been quantified very well. It's probably remnants of the vapor. Uh, we, we know there's some nanometer sized stuff in here. Uh, it just hasn't been quantified very well. There's sulfur in here, um, and probably some of the sulfur came from the asteroid. There's some isotopic anomalies here, but we don't really know how the sulfur appears. It matters whether the sulfur is just part of these cereals are plated onto other particles or independent particles. And there's no reason to think they were independent particles. I think that sulfur probably just recondensed on these um, bigger particles. So I personally don't think sulfur had much to do with the extinction event, but lots of other people do think that. And this is just another uh, high resolution image of the impact layer. So here's some of the spherules in here, and there's uh, all this other stuff in between the spherules. So you can count layers of spherules here, like two layers of spherules here or something. You really count them up. There's about 
the layers. So we've all seen individual shooting stars in a, in a, in a meteoritic storm. You'll often get one per minute or something like that. But in this case, there are 10,000 shooting stars on the surface per centimeter squared. So this was not a single particle slipping across the sky and leaving a radiant tail behind it. The entire sky was blazing like a sheet of lava that was about 40 kilometers above your head because of the frictional deposition of energy from all these particles re-entering the atmosphere at perhaps five or six kilometers per second speeds. Now these particles fell out later as a little drizzle kind of a thing. So it's not like this picture over here where the dinosaurs did not get hit in the head by big rocks and get knocked out. Instead, this, these things heat in the sky. So you can do an experiment at home if you want to and feel like one with the dinosaurs to know what they felt like. So I wouldn't do this personally, but I would go down to the grocery store and buy a dinosaur, a chicken or a turkey, they're avian dinosaurs, bring it home, turn your oven on broil, stick the dinosaur in there. And if you watch in 10 or so minutes, your broiler oven will have blackened the skin of the dinosaur and killed it where it alive. And of course, you can stick your hand in there if you want to and see how long you can hold it there before it becomes unpleasant, which will not be very long. So the dinosaurs probably were broiled alive. And this is not like sunlight. The sun is a point source. There are shadows you can hide in. The entire sky was glowing. There was no way to escape this unless you had a big hole to hide in. Everything bigger than about a German shepherd died in this event because they had no place to hide. Okay. So what happened here because of all the smoke as the fires went out and the glowing sky stopped after a few hours, we left with all the smoke in the air from the fires, the global fires. We know how much smoke was there because we could count the layers of smoke. I told you a minute ago about counting the layers of um, spheres, but the smoke, you can count those layers too. And it's like this dirty car here. If you take all the particles in the air and you bring them down to the ground and put them on something like this dirty car. It's not my car, but my car looks a lot like this sometimes. Um, there's about one layer here of dust in this dirty car. So that's an optical depth of one. For each layer, you get an optical depth of about one. There's 130 layers of smoke there. So the optical depth of the smoke is about 130. This graph is optical depth versus transmission. So you can see um, optical depth of one, you're losing 20 or 30 percent of the light or something. Optical depth of um, a few, losing your down to one percent of the light left. Optical depth of around 10, there was a limit of human vision, full moonlight, limit of photosynthesis. So it would be pitch black immediately after this event because of all the smoke in the atmosphere. What did this do? So what, what likely caused the extinctions in the oceans? On the land, it was probably the fires. It was a leading cause in the oceans, what happened? It's not fires. But instead, what happened is, is the sunlight was lost, plankton couldn't reproduce, and the food chain collapsed. So people don't quite understand normally the food chain in the oceans. On the land, we have a pyramidal food chain. There's trees and grasses at the bottom, Cows eat the grass, people eat the cows. Where I live in Colorado, mountain lions eat the people. There's not that many mountain lions around, so it's a pyramid with the mass at the bottom. And it takes about 10 years for carbon to completely overturn in this um, structure. So there's plenty of food in the land. You're not gonna starve to death quickly where there's 10 years worth of food. But on the, in the oceans, you have a food rectangle. The mass of plankton, zooplankton, is about equal to the mass of phytoplankton. The turnover time of carbon in the oceans is about 10 days. So the phytoplankton have to keep reproducing constantly uh, to convert enough sunlight into food so that the zooplankton can eat them and the fish can eat the zooplankton. If the phytoplankton stop doing that, even for a short time, the food chain will collapse. 
And this is a pattern we see in the oceans. The creatures that live near the surface and lived off of um, the plankton uh, photosynthetic cycle there uh, died. The ones that live deep in the deep oceans and lived on dead stuff drifting down from above uh, had no problem. The other thing all that soot does and the low light level uh, did was to lower the temperatures. So this is a map of surface temperature here, 18 to 40 something months after the impact. You know, so this is an average over more than a year, several years after the impact. All the green stuff is below freezing. 270 is a transition from green to yellow. So all the green stuff here is below freezing. There's some refugia here along some coastlines. So there are probably places where it was stayed above freezing and there was time between, uh, there was a growing season in some places near oceans. In the oceans, the temperatures also fell by about 10 degrees, but they were still above freezing. Here you can see the tropical oceans were in the 280 Kelvin range. So it was cold, um, colder than normal, but still above freezing. How did our ancestors survive? Who survived, not who died, who survived? So sheltering seems to be an important survival mechanism for land creatures. So for example, here's a little dinosaur ancestor, uh, this parrot living in a termite mound. Um, lots of birds seem to have revived, survived that lived near coastlines or in swamps. Um, so they had places they could hide from the glowing skies for a few hours. And they probably still had food. For example, there was very little extinction in lakes and rivers, probably because lots of vegetation was washing into them all the time, dead stuff. And also the animals that live there are used to changing climates. And so they had adapted to going long periods um, when it was cold. Our ancestors here, here's a typical mammal um, uh, in the current day, obviously. Um, but a lot of the mammals that survived were these uh, hole dwelling kinds of creatures. Um, and they survived by going down in their holes and getting away from the glowing skies and the cold temperatures and eating things like worms and roots and stuff like that that were underground. An interesting question is, if it hadn't been for the asteroid impact, who would represent Earth now? Um, Dale Russell thought about this back in the 1980s and he has these life-size figures in the Canadian Museum. Um, this guy in the back is a Trudon. You've probably seen similar creatures in lots of dinosaur movies. Um, Dale thought this was one of the most intelligent dinosaurs around based on brain size to body mass, which is about the same as an armadillo. And it's not probably too bright. Uh, and he thought it would evolve into a creature that looked like this, three fingers, good for cartoonists, big brain up here. And of course, he was criticized at the time because many people said, oh, well, this just looks like Dale Russell. Who knows what would have really happened? Okay, so let's switch topics now to talking about nuclear wars. So how many nuclear warheads are on the planet? <clears throat> so this is the first nuclear weapons that fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the Second World War <coughs> to um, 2015. You see there were 70,000 nuclear weapons in 1985. Seventy thousand nuclear weapons. So, uh, as you can tell, after 1985, the number of weapons began to fall, and it fell very quickly. Um, I'll get back to that in just a second. But right now, there's about 14,000 nuclear weapons on the planet, and, um, and strangely enough, treaties don't control all those weapons. U.S. and Russia have 90 something percent of these. <laughs> And the treaties only now consider the number of deployed strategic weapons. So each of the two countries, the US and Russia, <coughs> excuse me, are limited to about 2,000 weapons each. But each country also has an additional 2,000 weapons in storage, not covered by treaty, and many others that are being dismantled. So we have a, an odd treaty situation. 
and both the treaty that started this build down and the treaty limiting these weapons were abandoned in the Trump administration. Okay, so what happened in 1985? It was not the collapse of the Soviet Union that occurred in about 1992 down in this region. What did happen is an agreement between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev to begin to reduce nuclear weapons. So here's President Reagan's thoughts about this, which were presented in an interview in 1985 before they reached this agreement or talked about it. A great many reputable scientists are telling us that such a war could just end up in no victory for anyone because we would wipe out the earth as we know it. And if you think back to natural calamities, back in the last century in the 1800s, volcanoes, we saw the weather so changed that there was snow in July in many temperate countries, and they called it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the whole nuclear exchange, the nuclear winter that scientists have been talking about, it's possible. So Ronald Reagan understood nuclear winter and the effects of volcanic eruptions. Mikhail Gorbachev commented afterwards in 2000, models made by Russian and American scientists showed that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us, to people of honor and morality, to act in that situation. So the importance of this message is the science community told politicians that there was great danger in these nuclear weapons and they acted on that information. The United States and um, Russia are not the only country with nuclear weapons. Britain, China, France, Israel, Pakistan, India, and North Korea all have nuclear weapons. Um, and you can see that these countries all have between 100 and 300 nuclear weapons. Why are they picking 100 to 300 nuclear weapons? That's because the number of cities and their adversaries are smaller than that. For example, in the United States, there's only 300 cities with 100,000 people. In Russia, there's only 200 cities with 100,000 people. You don't need 70,000 weapons to attack 500 cities. There's no need to have ever gone anywhere near 70,000 nuclear weapons. And these countries recognize that arsenals of this size are enough to destroy their adversaries. So what's the destructive power of nuclear weapons? We know something about this from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as about 500 nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere. Well, this building here is a memorial um, Hiroshima. Uh, it was a um, right underground zero. Uh, and obviously, it wasn't completely destroyed. You can see everything out here was destroyed, except for a few concrete reinforced buildings, which are totally burned out. So most of this damage here is not from the nuclear weapons blast. Most of this damage is from a firestorm that happened and burned an area there. The area that's ignited by nuclear weapons a bright burst of light from them is much larger than the area in which there's extensive blast damage. And in fact, in the fires in Hiroshima, in the fires in Hiroshima, <clears throat> they released about a hundred times the energy of the atomic blast. This is a photograph of the firestorm in Hiroshima about three hours after the explosion. Now you can see it's a very violent storm with huge updrafts um, and uh, there are big pieces of stuff flying in the air. There are similar firestorms to this in um, Dresden and Hamburg, in Tokyo caused by incendiary bombing. This is the point of nuclear weapons. This is the way the Second World War was fought. It was not fought with conventional bombs. It was fought with incendiary bombs. 60 Japanese cities were burned to the ground these parts of them by incendiary bombing, requiring hundreds of airplanes. The whole point of nuclear weapons is that one weapon can destroy an entire city by catching it on fire. <clears throat> That's what their point is. And of course, there's some rain that was fell out of out of this 
firestorm, uh, slightly radioactive. Okay, we also know a lot about these kinds of firestorms from natural fires, as in forest fires. Uh, so this is an example of a Canadian fire in 2001. Here's a picture of the pyrocumulus from an airplane. You can see it's full of smoke. And in fact, it's overseeded because there's so many smoke particles in the cloud. So there are quite a few of these that have been observed. They do not have heavy precipitation. Most of the smoke is not removed quickly by precipitation in these thunderstorms. Um, here's a picture of the same thing from a satellite, and you can see when it hit the tropopause, it spread out. Most forest fires burn along a line, and line may be miles long and only a few hundred meters thick. So they're not area fires, they're line fires. So they're not very large compared to the depth of the atmosphere. But occasionally a forest fire will burn an area, and that can cause a firestorm. And in fact, a nuclear weapon, even a moderate size nuclear weapon, will burn an area whose diameter is comparable to the scale head of the atmosphere. So you have a hot bubble at the ground, as big as the atmosphere is deep. It will rise until it hits a tropopause and maybe into the stratosphere, carrying smoke with it. We now have two examples in which smoke actually was injected into the stratosphere in such great quantities that satellites could see it for more than eight months. The first of these happened in 2017, and the next one happened in um, 2020 in Australia. The first one was in Canada. So this is just an example of some of the data from this. So we have um, data on smoke, which is these squares, and um, we have ozone and water anomalies. And then we also have a model that's following and tracking this, and you can see the model is pretty close to the data. So what we have here is the smoke is injected down here around 12 kilometers and um, 10 or so days after the fire started. The smoke had risen from 12 kilometers, which is in the data and it immediately, uh, and it rose to 20 kilometers within about two weeks. This is a prediction from the 1980 studies of nuclear winter that solar heating would heat the smoke so much that it would rise deep into the stratosphere and this is the first time we've actually seen this happen, uh, confirming those earlier predictions. This is an important thing because if you have a fire, a line fire, for example, and a forest fire, the smoke goes into the lower atmosphere and is quickly rained out by rainfall. But if you put smoke into the stratosphere, it never rains in the stratosphere. So the smoke can stay there for years and cause a climate change. Okay, so from here, of course, we don't have any further observations. It's not an experiment we can do. But here's some examples <clears throat> from some work by Alan Robux group on the um, <clears throat> effects of a war between India and Pakistan, in which 50 nuclear weapons were exploded in each country. <clears throat> the smoke was injected down here below the tropopause, which is this solid line. And you can see now, <clears throat> about a, a month after the war started, that the most smoke is up here above 30 kilometers or 10 millibars and even goes even higher to 50 or 60 kilometers and higher top models it goes up to 80 kilometers so smoke rises to great height <clears throat> far above rainfall which is restricted down here this graph over here is the optical depths of the smoke <clears throat> you can see there are less than a tenth um, <clears throat> and now we're on july 6th so we're starting again may 14th here's a the uh, war starting because it heats the stratosphere so much strong gradients temperature gradients are created which creates winds that quickly make the smoke spread out so here we are two weeks after this computer war the smoke covers the northern hemisphere completely and you can see that after about three weeks it's coming down and touching antarctica so this quickly becomes a global smoke layer <clears throat> What does it do to the climate? So this is a calculation of the temperature change in the northern hemisphere at the surface following this regional nuclear war between India and Pakistan. This curve here is a so-called hockey stick, warming due to CO2 down here in the modern era. <clears throat> and here's the nuclear war, this red line, temperatures drop down here. 
So this war, starting from these elevated temperatures, <clears throat> is creating the coldest temperatures in the last thousand years. It's colder than the Little Ice Age, which is in this period in here. It's colder <clears throat> than the year without a summer that Ronald Reagan referred to, which is this point here. Coldest temperatures of a thousand years. <clears throat> The importance of these cold temperatures is that they shorten the growing season. So if the growing season is shortened by 30 days <clears throat> in the year or so after this event, um, it's blue. So all these regions here have growing seasons shortened by more than a month. And across, certainly across Canada and the Northeastern US, Europe and Russia. There's not very long growing seasons in these high latitudes normally. So this is a severe climate change and has a big effect on agricultural productivity, especially in these regions. Okay, the other thing that happens is that the soot absorbs sunlight. And you can see here that the temperatures in the stratosphere, this for example, right here is a lower stratosphere this is 30 kilometers, this is about 20 kilometers. In this region here, the temperature is increased by 50 degrees centigrade for two years. And it's even 10 degrees centigrade above normal, going out to years eight and nine. These high temperatures affect ozone reaction rates that destroy ozone and you lose a lot of ozone. So here's a calculation by Mike Mills of the ozone loss. <clears throat> so in a current, Global Earth model. This is the ozone distribution. These little dots mark the edge of the ozone hole, 220 Dobson units. 17 months after this war, in the NCAR community climate model, the entire Earth is covered with ozone hole levels of ozone. If you were a Caucasian, you wouldn't be able to walk outside your house for more than a few tens of minutes without getting a bad sunburn. You can, of course, put on sunscreen, go inside your house, but plants and animals can't do that. We have no idea what this would do to the biota to have these big ozone losses <clears throat> because we've never observed such a thing in nature. And there's very limited data from laboratory studies on the response of plants and animals to ozone loss. We have an agricultural group that's been working on this problem, and they've been studying the effects of it on plants due to the temperature and precipitation anomalies. So and this is a war between India and Pakistan. So here we see corn losses uh, for about five years here that are around 25%. Soybean losses about 40% for five years. Uh, wheat losses about 30% for five years. These are all mid-latitude crops, and they're strongly affected because it's already cold at mid-latitudes. You make it colder, it's harder to grow things. In the tropics, it's normally pretty warm. You make it a little colder. It doesn't have such a big effect. And so this is rice, a few percent loss, cotton, you know, four percent or something loss, sugar cane, um, not very large loss. So the point of this is very large losses at mid-latitudes. Russia would be severely impacted by this. Other studies we've done suggest Russia would be unable to feed its population for quite a few years after a war between India and Pakistan. A lot of people heard the story of Joseph, an Egyptian pharaoh um, in the Bible, which is also a story in the Quran. The Pharaoh is dreaming about seven cows and wants to know what it means. He asked Joseph, who happened to be in prison and was good at interpreting dreams. And Joseph said, there's going to be seven good years, store grain, because there's then going to be seven bad years you can feed your population then. But the current world does not have seven years of grain storage. It has 60 to 75 days, a month or a month and a half of grain and storage to feed the earth. After uh, 60 to after two months, two and a half months, there's not enough grain to feed the global population. Starvation will result. Right now, what happens is you transport food from countries producing food to countries which are in winter. 
average cities only have about seven days of food on hand. We have to carry food in constantly to keep them fed. We just see an example of this in Texas, where a few days in, uh, of power losses and uh, you don't have food to feed the population in the cities are running out of food. <clears throat> so this is a sphere problem. Our group has never attempted to predict how many people would affect that, be affected by this, but a um, group of physicians has looked at this problem, their health and in particular, and uh, about a billion people are at or below the minimum daily re calorie requirement on the present day earth. These people with chronic malnutrition malnutrition today are likely to die. So a war between India and Pakistan could kill a billion people by starvation, and maybe a hundred million people from bomb blasts. So the starvation is an order of magnitude, bigger problem than the explosions from the bombs. Of course, the bigger problem here is not India and Pakistan, it's the US and Russia, which has had agreements limiting nuclear weapons, which are currently in need of being renegotiated. So it's very important that the science community provide advice to politicians about what to do. One Trident missile carrying submarine is more powerful than a thousand Hiroshima bombs. A submarine like this can carry a <clears throat> hundred warheads on missiles. They're typically 10 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. So a thousand times more energy here than the Hiroshima bombs. <clears throat> so the treaties we have do not consider the climate consequences of nuclear conflicts. Down here, we see the amount of soot produced by an India-Pakistan war involving 100 weapons, which was about a third as many as they currently have, about five teragrams, five million tons of soot. The arsenals allowed in the treaties in the Bush and Obama administrations would produce something like 150 million tons of black carbon in the stratosphere. When military people advise politicians, they base their advice on the blast wave and how many buildings or targets would be destroyed by the blast wave. They want to be assured that they can destroy all the targets they think are important. They do not consider these fires and their effects on the population. So the fact that even India and Pakistan here could kill a billion people is a collateral damage. It's not something the generals and politicians think about. What happens in the northern Earth's surface temperatures after a global conflict? So here we have the hockey stick again, carbon dioxide global warming. Here's the India-Pakistan war, a little dip here, um, around one degree from the conditions that are current there. Ice age temperatures around minus five degrees. This is a northern hemisphere temperature. And the predicted temperature here um, from the um, NASA GIS model, about minus 10 degrees. So it's colder than in the last ice age. Of course, the last ice age lasted for tens of thousands of years, whereas this effect is only gonna last for a decade or so. Nevertheless, it was severe cold. What does this mean for agriculture? This is not difficult to, to understand. You don't need an agricultural team to understand this. <clears throat> so this graph shows temperature here. Um, and uh, this is a global average, or this is a temperature, excuse me, in the Ukraine. But anyway, the temperature in the Ukraine, Iowa is very similar to the Ukraine. Iowa is kind of the breadbasket of the US. And the Ukraine is a breadbasket of Europe and Russia. <clears throat> so here we have normal temperatures, um, winter, summer, winter, summer. And here we have the temperatures after this war. So coming up here, normally the war starts, temperatures immediately drop below freezing. They stay below freezing all summer, all winter, all the next summer, all the next winter. They barely poke above freezing here in the second um, summer. So this is a nuclear winter. It's below freezing at mid-latitudes for a considerable period of time. 
nothing is going to grow under this kind of scenario with mid latitudes. Okay, so now let's try to put this together uh, and what we uh, learned from these various examples. So here's a Pakistan India war, um, modest cooling, a couple of degrees perhaps. I'm sorry, we're talking about sunlight first. So this is a 10% light loss or something like that. And uh, your computer wants to move itself. Here's a US Russia war. Um, so we have a light loss here initially of about um, down to 20% of normal. You know, that's what it looks like under a thunderstorm, a heavy thunderstorm, about 20% light levels. This would not be good for growing crops, but it's well above the photosynthetic limit. So we see in the KPG case when the dinosaurs died, this, the um, paleogene Cretaceous boundary, you were below the photosynthetic limit for a couple of years that caused extinctions in the oceans. And it never got that low in the calculations of the US Russia case. Probably not going to lead to extinctions in the oceans, but it probably will do things. We just don't, it's just not as easy to know. The global level average temperatures fall significantly. Um, several degrees for India and Pakistan, nine degrees for US Russia. We actually hit the global freezing point down here after the Cretaceous Paleogene case. The global average temperature reaches the freezing point. So severe temperature drops in all those cases. Precipitation falls due to soot. So India, Pakistan lost about 20% of global precipitation. The U.S. Russia war we lost 60%. After the KPG case, maybe 80%. Ozone also falls due to set. So India, Pakistan, you've lost about 40% of the ozone layer globally. US, Russia, you've lost about 70%. The KPG case, about 80%. Of course, in these bigger cases, the soot absorbs some of the ultraviolet light. So it's not immediately impactful, but it doesn't absorb all of it in India and Pakistan or in the US, Russia case either. There's still harmful UV reaching the surface. Okay, so what does all this mean? How do we put this together? So this is stratosphere. So these fires in 2017 and 2020 put in something like 0.01 teragrams of black carbon. In the stratosphere, it did interesting things in the stratosphere, it didn't affect the surface to any easily measurable degree. Okay, then we have um, the death of the dinosaurs, 75% of all the species on the planet were up here by six orders of magnitude in black carbon to somewhere around 15,000 billion tons of black carbon. That caused mass extinction because everything on the surface burned. India, Pakistan were up by about a factor of 100 from these big fires that were observed in 2017 and 2020 by 50 nuclear weapons in Pakistan and 50 in India. Uh, we predict that that will cause agricultural failures in mid-latitude countries, especially in places like Russia and Canada. Black carbon injections from a nuclear war involving the US and Russia and Europe, probably 150 teragrams or million tons from about 4,000 weapons altogether. This is gonna produce freezing temperatures for several years at mid latitudes. You can see that nothing is going to grow in this kind of a scenario. Okay, so right now we can't stop an asteroid impact, but people are at least thinking about it. I like this picture because this is the way that uh, the public sees this problem through the media. If you have an asteroid about to hit the earth, you don't take scientists and astronauts and send them up to stop it. No, you go get some oil field workers. The oil field workers launch a satellite, a spacecraft to the asteroid, they land, they put a nuclear weapon in the asteroid, they blow it to pieces. Evidently, the hard part of this is drilling a hole, which oil field workers know how to do. And of course, in most of the movie, they fight over the girl who's on the spacecraft. <clears throat> it would be better if, the scientists were shown doing this problem. And blowing it up with a nuclear weapon is not what you do. You just put a sail on it and sail it away. 
It remains to be seen if we can prevent a nuclear conflict from global starvation. But history shows the world scientific community can help eliminate nuclear weapons. So we advised Reagan and Gorbachev in the early 1980s about the dangers of nuclear winter. They listened, they did something. Every president since Reagan and Gorbachev in both Russia and the United States has built down nuclear weapons, especially Republican presidents in the United States. Most of the reductions occurred in the two Bush administrations. So that can happen. What can you do? So not very much work has been done on the physical effects of impacts. There's a lot of climate science to be done. Three-dimensional models only started about five years ago. We don't have the technology to stop a collision. Uh, people can still think of inventive ways to stop an asteroid. Nuclear environmental effects, very few people have worked on this problem. More research is needed. This is a very complex problem. There's lots of issues here, ranging from how cities burn and which fuel is there, through climate modeling to agricultural and economic modeling. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Politicians are not aware of environmental effects of nuclear war, probably because very few scientists have worked on this problem. Education and analysis by national science academies is needed. There is supposedly a National Academy study that's going to take place in the next year and see if that happens. Right now, our collaboration working on this involves about 20 scientists, and uh, the, this picture shows you some of them. So, thank you very much. I'm going to end my show here. Thanks, Professor Toon. If anyone has any questions, they are free to raise their virtual hand and I will unmute them, or they can type their question in the chat and I'll read it out loud. Um, there was a question during your presentation um, that I can just start with. It was from Suresh Basu. He asks, why would smoke particulates deposit in distinct layers instead of gradually in some, some continuum? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. Could you repeat that? Yeah, sure. So it was... Why would smoke particul particulates deposit in distinct layers instead of gradually in some continuum? Oh, well, this has to do with the time resolution in the geologic record. Um, so the closest timing that you can get from isotopic measurements um, is about 30 to 50,000 years. So if you were you know, to look at this with um, normal techniques for dating things, you can only resolve about a 50,000 year cycle uh, period. Now that layer, because it contains these spherules and iridium, we know the spherules fell out first, which you would expect. You'd expect them to fall out in a few days because they're pretty heavy, they're like sand. Um, and, and the iridium is on top of them. The iridium is in small particles, some of it's in the big ones, but some of it's in small particles. And we expect those to fall out of the atmosphere from these calculations in a couple of years. And so, um, of course, then it probably had to fall to the bottom of the ocean, which is also uh, less than a year time type time scale for the big things and maybe a year from the little ones. So that layer is probably only about a year long. And so that's one reason we know that the fires occurred within the same period of time that the um, smoke was being, that the um, material is falling out from the asteroid collision. So it isn't like asteroid collision, 100 years later fires, that didn't happen. The fires happened at the same time as the debris was clearing um, from the asteroid collision. They probably happened immediately afterwards because those glowing skies caught everything on fire. Thanks. We have another question from Ross Salowich. Ross, I'm just trying to find you on the attendee list. And you are unmuted. Hi, Brian. A uh, fantastic talk, although, you know, not particularly cheerful in a way, but fantastic. Um, and of course, we have to avoid it at all costs. Um, I have kind of two questions. Um, and one might be kind of a little bit unfair because it's sort of new, although it's been lurking. And that's about the recent work from Harvard Center for Astrophysics. Um, there's a paper that came out about two weeks ago suggesting that it was a comet and not an asteroid um, that was responsible. I know it's kind of a little 
an odd question, but you, of course, mentioned trying to prevent asteroids from hitting, and they're suggesting another suggestion that it was not an asteroid but a comet. Do you, have you thought about that? And is the, uh, you know, the iridium and the other metals um, really telltale for an asteroid, in your opinion? Yeah, so the debris we have left on the surface is rock. It's not ice. And of course, comets can contain rocks, so we couldn't exclude their idea is a big 50 kilometer diameter comet came whipping through the solar system. And um, but it's not a 50 kilometer object that hit the ground. We know that because we know how big the crater is, you know, it was 10 kilometers or something. So comets, some comets, in fact, some asteroids are probably interiors of comets that are left over the ice evaporates from solar heating and leaves behind a bunch of rocks. In the theory that Harvard people propose the comet breaks up and releases smaller pieces of itself. Um, but, you know, we have debris left on the surface. It's clearly asteroidal, or at least it's the composition of some asteroids, which, as I said, could be parts of comets earlier. And uh, we know how much is on the surface. You know, you can add that mass back up. It's about a two, 10 kilometer rock. You know, the crater was caused by about a 10 kilometer object. Um, so, in my mind, uh, I don't think a comet's a very likely explanation for what hit the Earth, um, but I'll let the uh, comet and asteroid people fight this out. It doesn't matter to us. All that debris is out there on the surface. It's still there. You take the soot that's on the ground, you know how much is there, you put it back into the atmosphere. It had to have been in the stratosphere because there's a long way, the sample plate locations are from the oceans. It's a long way from the land. Um, so we're just putting that smoke back into the air. Thanks, Brian. I had another question, but I'll hold off if there are other questions. Has he? Yeah, you have us. There's, there's one more question in the, um, in the chat that you already unmuted, so go ahead. Okay, um, so um, Brian, kind of an obvious follow on to your fantastic conversation, and especially with so many people on board, is to just ask you the question if you would care to comment on geoengineering by you know, stratospheric injections. And I asked the question because it's an obvious one, but plus, as you know, there's going to be an experiment from S range very soon by David Keith and that group to kind of test the technology. So it's back in the news. Geoengineering. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to geoengineer with soot. Uh, that uh, was suggested by Paul Crutzen. Um, and the if, the, if you put soot in the stratosphere, it would heat the stratosphere, you'd get ozone loss out of that. So you wouldn't want to use soot for this. However, um, there's some work at NOAA by Wushan Gao and other people who are suggesting that you could actually deposit other materials in the upper troposphere with soot, a small amount of soot in it, and it would loft the stuff into the stratosphere. So this solves a problem in how you get the stuff into the stratosphere. My, in my mind, um, this is geoengineering is not a good idea. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to tell how much it would cost. Um, I think it'd be quite expensive. Other people don't think it's so expensive. Um, but it, it can't really, especially like sulfates, most common suggestion is you put a bunch of sulfates into the stratosphere. And the problem with this is that Number one, it doesn't solve the ocean acidification problem because it doesn't get rid of the CO2. Number two, it isn't going to work toward the end of the century. By the end of the century, you have, you know, at present times, you could probably do something with tens of teragrams of sulfur, or maybe even a few teragrams of sulfur every year being ejected. But by the end of the century, you have to start injecting like 100 teragrams of sulfur. That's all the sulfur that's released by all the coal burning. Uh, currently happening. You're never going to put that much sulfur into the stratosphere. It's just not going to work. Um, and even David Keith and people like that recognize that. And I haven't heard a talk by him recently, but the last talks he was advocating that um, geoengineering would help us out for a few decades, but then we'd have to suck the CO2 out of the air because it would be so far out of control. Um, so I, I think geoengineering is nothing but a SOP to allow um, the continuing burning of fossil fuels. And the real solution to this is to stop burning fossil fuels. Uh, that's what we're gonna have to do. And uh, you know, there are other geoengineering schemes 
<clears throat> besides in the stratosphere, you can imagine like trying to brighten stratus clouds in the marine boundary layer. You know, there's not that much of the earth that's covered in stratus clouds, but it would help. Um, <clears throat> so I, I just think it's a bad idea. Thanks, Brian. I'll, I'll pass the wand to somebody else for more questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ross and Dr. Professor Toon. We have another question um, from Zing King Wu. They ask, how many scientists were working on this topic in the 1980s that made the presidents at the time aware of the issue? <clears throat> well, when the uh, idea came up <clears throat> in the 1980s, partly because of the discovery of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, that's what made our group think about it. <clears throat> there were probably, um, well, there was some work by Crutzen and Burks, which really wasn't about nuclear winter. They thought there'd be a bunch of forest fires that would put smoke in the boundary layer and cause poisoning by gases and a lot of short-term effects. <clears throat> then there was our, our group that had about five people in it. Uh, but uh, we fortunately had Carl Sagan as a member of the group. <clears throat> and Carl was a very famous person at the time and he had a lot of ability to communicate with the public and with politicians. Uh, and um, I don't want to go through all the politics of this, but basically NASA said, we worked for NASA at the time that we couldn't publish this work without a review. And so Carl ordered, organized a review. Uh, and uh, so he invited everybody in the world that he could think of that knew something about this area, including people from Russia. <clears throat> and then we all had a meeting on the East Coast, I think it was in Boston. And so about 100 people or possibly more reviewed the paper and a lot of them went back to work on it. So at that time, there were quite a few people from the Department of Energy, which is a group that builds bombs that worked on it. Um, and so there was a National Academy study. There was our review of it. Uh, you know, and it, it kind of, there were a lot of people very, including Ross Salovich, people very interested in it um, back in those days. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, eventually Congress, you know, even before we did this, even before nuclear winter was discovered, Congress had ordered the Department of Defense to write an unclassified report about what would happen if there was a nuclear war. <clears throat> and they did write that and they said, well, 100 million Americans would probably die from a full-scale nuclear war from the number of weapons that were then available. Um, so after Carl had publicized this, he had debates in Congress with Ed Reteller. Um, people heard about it because of the Academy study and because of uh, publicity that he gave it through television shows and writing in Floride Magazine. Um, the Congress then required the Department of Defense to fund a, an open study uh, that involved a lot of people, like Alan Roebuck worked on the problem because of that open study. And um, there was actually a lot of good science done from that about black carbon and a lot of model development. Some people have claimed that the development of global climate modeling really had its birth in the nuclear winter studies because a lot of global climate models were developed there. But after about three years, the Department of uh, Defense shut that down. And um, so I would guess that after some time, like the mid 1980s, you could not be funded to work on this problem. You cannot be funded currently to work on the problem. No federal agency would give you money to work on this problem. Alan and I have a proposal with a foundation that is supporting a small group of about 10 people to work on this problem. Um, as far as I know, there's a small group in the Department of Energy that started working on it um, a few years ago, mostly because Alan and I and our coworkers have attempted to write as many science papers as we could to try to get people to work on this problem and tell the politicians that there was an issue here they had to address. Thanks, Professor Toon. Are there any other questions? It's actually a part of my queue, but if anyone has any questions, I can raise their hand now. I'll catch them before we finish up. Oh, 
Okay. Well, in that case, thank you, Professor Toon, for coming, giving us this great talk. It was really definitely different from what we normally talk about here, but it was really interesting. Um, and everybody else, please come back next week as we continue our seminar series. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Professor Toon. Uh, we will send you the uh, video recording after once we get. Thank you so much. Okay.